want to uh, ask him uh, further questions. Next, we have the uh, Mike Ferrillo, who's the uh, Associate Dean for Research and Scholarly Communications for the University Libraries. Um, yesterday, we talked a lot about um, digital humanities, and, and Mike's going to share with us one of the um, initiatives that's going on with digital humanities uh, currently here at the university. Mike? Thanks. I'm going to switch over here. Okay. part of the parade of middle-aged guys talking about technology. So, no offense. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit, as, as John just said, about a project that's underway here at Penn State. I'm also going to talk a little bit first about <laughs> libraries and support for digital humanities in general, um, and provide a real brief overview, um, not as deep as one would like, um, or at least as I would like, maybe you're happy with it. Uh, and then talk a little bit about that project. So, if you were at the workshop yesterday, you heard me say some of these things, but I will um, repeat them now, perhaps a little bit more clearly now that I've had some time to rehearse. Um, digital humanities is a mode of scholarship, and it's also a way of enhancing existing modes of scholarship. I think there's, you know, there's any number of different definitions. I don't really have a good one. Um, but the point I would make here is that it, the library is a natural partner for supporting it in a university. The librarians do research. We are researchers ourselves. We also facilitate research. And increasingly, we find ways and look for ways to incubate it to give uh, research an opportunity to um, uh, get started in ways that, that go beyond providing straightforward access to information. Digital Humanities is a kind of activity that really requires community and it by, uh, by its nature builds community at the same time. One of the reasons I, I say this is that the university is not well set up to support advanced technology, compute, advanced computing research in the humanities. I mean, it's, if you, if you, even if you talk to scientists in this university, they're going to tell you that the university is not well set up to provide computing, research computing support for, for, uh, for researchers in their fields. Um, it takes a community of researchers and practitioners to work together and learn together and bring forward ideas. And this is true of all the scholarship, but I think it's especially true of scholarship that is trying to break some ground and take advantage of some emerging tools. Uh, at the same time, I want to point out that the humanities, digital humanities in particular, contributes to research infrastructure. What do I mean by that? These kinds of projects, these kinds of research programs tend to create tools or applications that others can use. They create new data or new collections that others can use that can be used in research or in teaching. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with the concept of research infrastructure in the humanities, you might want to go back to a bit of a chestnut of a report that was published a few years ago by the American Council of Learned Societies on uh, cyber infrastructure for the humanities. So the last point I want to make here is about a collaboration between the libraries and the College of Liberal Arts that we have titled the Humanities in the Digital Age. Uh, the goal of this collaboration is to promote scholarship, rigorous scholarship, cross-disciplinary scholarship, uh, at a moment when we know that research and teaching has been transformed by technologies and will continue to be so. Uh, the question of whether or not we're talking about a new mode of scholarship or a new mode of presentation or whether enhancing of existing modes I think is open for debate and I think it depends on where, what your questions are, what you're trying to achieve. Uh, the libraries and, and the college are investing in this application or in this program uh, in various ways. <laughs> Firstly, by providing cookies at yesterday's workshop. Um, I just want to cite that again, that is very important. Um, and then also we're going to be looking at uh, a joint hire for a position that we're going to call a, uh, for now, a humanities, uh, digital humanities research consultant, someone who can help faculty and graduate students design research projects or help them uh, explore the use of technology to explore their questions. So um, that that's all I want to say about that for right now. I want to get back up and give you a little bit more background on how libraries have supported digital humanities and then talk about one project. Lots of people have said this. I've said it myself. It's a nice, um, handy uh, quote to use when we're talking about the kinds of support we can provide, and uh, I think it's especially true. Uh, you don't usually come into the library to, to the beaker. Uh, not always, anyway. You might come in to check out the skeleton that we have in life sciences, but um, generally the lab for the humanities is in special collections. 
uh, in many cases. Uh, I think there are three different models for um, support of uh, digital humanities in libraries and it kind of moves through cohabitation to adoption. Um, and I'm going to force this metaphor with all my might in the next few minutes here. Uh, the first, what I mean by cohabitation first, um, let's, this is the obligatory middle-aged guy, boy, this wasn't technology cool 30 years ago <laughs> screen. Um, Cole had Pong, I've got Gopher. Um, about 30, 25 years ago, uh, or about 20 years ago, libraries began to receive these CD-ROMs, and uh, these CD-ROMs would have, you know, really extensive textual databases on them, and they were like, you know, dozens of uh, megabytes uh, in size. Uh, and, you know, we in libraries provided access to them on a single workstation. You had to come in and use the Patrologia Latina uh, on your own uh, with hopefully some guidance from the librarian who spent some time working on it. Some libraries also began to use Gopher as a way of distributing e-texts at that time. Uh, if you remember Gopher, you know it was kind of a menu-driven, directory-driven, um, uh, World Wide Web uh, export, uh, tool. Uh, what I would... Um, emphasize though is that at this time when we were beginning that work we were really treating those those kinds of projects and that activity as specimens right they were they were unique they were you know they were beautiful you could, they were kind of in their own box and pinned to a, a single workstation uh, they were not necessarily um, you know a, a project where we could work actively and collaborate and help create new knowledge they were really about consumption of knowledge. And I think that's even true now that a lot of projects that libraries undertake are still treated as here's our one special project and you know you might question whether or not I've got a specimen coming up in a few minutes. Another mode of cohabitation would be providing space to faculty or to research centers in the humanities. Uh, this also began in the mid-90s. Uh, one example I know of that is the Institute for Advanced Technology in the Humanities at the University of Virginia where they um, moved the microform, I was a graduate student there at this time, they moved the microform collection to the other side of the building, created all this space, uh, and technologists and faculty were suddenly in the libraries. Um, sometimes those kinds of cohabitations can lead to romance. It's like a TV show or a sitcom. <laughs> and, uh, and so the library and the, and the, and the digital humanities, humanities folks start collaborating more. In fact, the head of, the original head of IAP went off to become the dean of the library school at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, about 10 years ago. So there's a great deal of cross-fertilization in these disciplines. Um, and sometimes what has led, what that's come about after that has been that libraries and, uh, and colleges have created digital humanities centers together. So this is one I'm aware of, the Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities. Trevor Munoz is the associate director. He's also an assistant dean of the library. It's kind of jointly owned and operated. Another example of this is at the University of Nebraska, their Center for Digital Research in the Humanities. These centers are a lot like what you expect from other research centers on the university campus. They are there to help facilitate research programs, to, to attract funding, usually from uh, external sponsors. Um, they promote scholarship, they provide training, they provide hosting for grant-funded programs. Um, the problem is they are really reliant on that external funding, right? They really exist because of that external funding. And you don't always see a lot of dedicated full-time support going back to that center, except maybe for the faculty lines in there. So if you don't have a grant, these centers may be of some help, but they're not necessarily going to be a, a full-scale service provider. So what kinds of services might you be needing if you were looking for support in digital humanities work. And these are the kinds of things that I would say libraries have done, can do. Um, the deeper you go on this list, the more complicated, expensive, and, um, and, um, uh, and actually rare, unfortunately, it is. So, you know, we still support folks by acquiring materials. We digitize collections. We provide labs. Um, we can provide some training in some cases. We do one-on-one -on -one consultation sometimes, but in you know, more advanced cases, libraries can acquire software and make it available for institutions, or they might be hosting a project, or in some rare cases where I would say full-scale adoption is happening, you've got um, programming expertise available for the community. So the, the best example I have of that kind of adoption is again at UVA, um, and I guess I should say I'm a graduate of UVA, so I know a lot about there, and you know, sorry, uh, there are other places, I promise. But uh, the Scholars Lab at the University of Virginia is really a full-fledged digital humanities center inside the library. Uh, it has about 3,000 square feet of lab space on the main floor of the library. It's, you know, it's, it's beautiful. Um, 
uh, it is, uh, it's, you know, not unlike our knowledge commons, uh, but the staff there is really dedicated to supporting visual scholarship. And so you've got programmers, web developers, systems analysts, uh, consultants for social science data as well, uh, working together to provide the various programs. One is the Praxis program. The Praxis program is a graduate fellowship program for, uh, for students in the College of uh, Arts and Sciences. Uh, it's really meant to design, develop a cohort of graduate students who can learn from each other and, uh, and explore ways of using tools in their, in their research going forward. They sponsor a number of institutes around the use of uh, geographic information systems or just simply geodata and the humanities. So they've got, a, I just saw they've got a new journal that they started today, uh, or saw the announcement of the day. I posted to the last Twitter feed. I, I don't recall the name of it. So um, they sometimes get grants to create tools, but they're really there as a service, as a service provider to the institution. Now, the libraries here, we're not there yet. I mean, we, we can provide a lot of those services, but we don't have this kind of full-fledged support. But I do want to talk about an early collaboration that we began here a few years ago with the uh, Georgian Ann Richards Civil War Era Center. Uh, that's led by Bill Blair. And a few years ago, uh, Eric Novotny brought Bill Blair into the library and we started talking about uh, digitizing Civil War era materials. And Bill had this very interesting point, especially for someone from the South, like myself, which is that no one really knows anything about the Northern home experience during the Civil War period. Um, if you are, you know, if you were from the South, you had Sherman knocking on your door with a torch and you were writing it down in your diary and then years later somebody was republishing that diary. It really wasn't happening in the North because Sherman wasn't knocking on your door with a torch. Um, so there's, there's a real dearth of primary resources available about uh, the home, the lived experience of civilians during the Civil War period uh, in the Pennsylvania area and in the North in general. So, uh, you know, how can we solve this problem? How can we get this material uh, out there? How can we find it? How do we make it accessible to the, to the broader community? And this, is, this dovetailed very nicely with a question I always have in the libraries, which is how should we spend, be spending our time? And who's gonna be using the stuff that we have anyway? Um, if there are collections out there that we have that could be useful, how can we improve access to them? Um, and the truth is all libraries, all cultural heritage institutions are under-resourced, unless you're Harvard, and even then they would make the claim that they are too, in some ways. Um, I heard that, I heard, I heard a map librarian say that once, and I just, you know, wanted to walk away. Uh, so uh, the, the question that I have is how can the students, how can the faculty, how can the researchers at this university help us make better informed choices about how this research about, about these collections and how we make collections accessible. So we uh, put together a grant proposal and, uh, and it's an extraordinarily analog kind of process. Um, Sabra Statham, who is back here as project coordinator for this, um, designed a, a survey methodology that basically involved uh, people driving out to smaller county historical societies throughout the state of Pennsylvania and digging through boxes and finding out what they had, summarizing it, writing the brief descriptions of it, um, and then trying to evaluate its, uh, its utility for the study of the Civil War North home front. Based on that experience, we've, I think we've gotten something like 500 collections described, um, and a lot of these are in smaller organ, you know, previously these didn't have catalog records. You wouldn't necessarily find them on the web. Okay, so a lot of these are, you know, it's really about making hidden collections accessible. Mm -hmm. Um, the real goal that we had for this was how to bring this stuff online, and so we, we needed to evaluate how we would choose materials. You know, how do we choose materials for digitization? And um, here we really deferred to the historians. Right? The historians know, uh, Bill says there's three categories of collections. There's good stuff, really good stuff, and you gotta go back uh, uh, when you're dealing with archival collections. And so for the stuff that you had to go back to, we started isolating those materials that had um, physical, you know, or good enough physical shape that we could scan it, get it online without damage to those collections. We've begun that process this year. We'll bring four or five small collections from places like the Blair County Historical Society, small court letters, correspondence collections, uh, just to get started. Um, but I wanna talk about one project where it, you know, it comes back to this question of what can you do with the stuff once you've got it digitized. And as we went through this project, we found this very interesting document in Belfont, out in Belfont, 
called the histor uh, the list of the descriptive list of deserters uh, from Pennsylvania or something. I've got the title all wrong there, but we just call it the deserters roster. And it's essentially about 300 pages with about a listing of about 40,000 individuals who apparently deserted from the Union service during the Civil War. And uh, we think this was uh, Bill thinks this was um, created sort of so as to help. Um, you know, ferret out who deserved benefits, whether or not, you know, so if someone shows up saying, I deserve a benefit, no, actually you deserted at, at, um, at Gettysburg here. Um, so it's a really fascinating document, not just because it's a list of people who quit, or, you know, it's like the, the untold story of non, non-heroism in, uh, in Pennsylvania, but because the amount of personal detail that's recorded here, and these are, this is a detail from that last screen. The very first line there about Daniel Schaefer, he was, he was mustered in as a rank, at the rank of private, at the age of 19, he was five feet nine and a half. He had light skin, gray eyes, and brown hair. He was born in Reading. We don't know where he lived when he was enlisted, but we know he was a cigar maker. And uh, he was enlisted on June 4th, 1861. Uh, we know who mustered him in and when. Uh, and this goes on to say where, in some cases, where the individual deserted from. You've got not just Pennsylvanians, but foreign-born uh, individuals, citizens, or, 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 or immigrants who are, who are listed in here. And there's this real wealth of demographic data that, that is kind of locked up in this printed volume. And even though we have scanned it, and you can go on to the library's digital collections and search free text, you can search for like Reading and find Reading, you know, 20,000 times. And there, you can't search across the fields on the columns, right? You can't find out, okay, show me everybody from Reading, right? Or show me all the cigar makers. Um, and so the goal we have for this project, for this um, collection right now is, get this stuff into a database. Um, and I'm hoping that at the end of the day, you'll all be taking uh, a copy of one of these pages and you'll be transcribing this into a nice Excel spreadsheet. Um, actually, what we will probably do this fall is experiment with doing some data capture off of a few regiments, a few pages, uh, and then use that as a model to see what it would cost and how we might go about either uh, taking it to the crowd, putting it online, having a larger crowd, you know, a larger group of uh, folks around the world transcribing this, or to see what we might be able to do to uh, pay for transcription services. That'll be fairly extensive. This, I cite this as an example of, okay, so we've got this stuff, what can you do with it? And I frankly only know that it would be cool to look on a map and see how many thousands of people are from the northwest part of the state who deserted. it. I'm not an historian by training. I don't have the questions to ask of that. Um, but I think there are people here and at other places around the world who do have questions to ask of this, uh, of this resource. And for me, that's the exciting part of being involved in the library and working with researchers in the humanities and in other fields as well. But finding out what questions you all have that you want to bring to the material that we are, we are collecting and making accessible. So that's my uh, brief uh, story about digital humanities and libraries. And I'll be glad to stick around and talk to anybody later on. I do have a phone call at 11, so I may not be able to hang around for very long, but I'll be back later in the day. Okay, that's it. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so we are gonna uh, just make a slight adjustment to our schedule here, and I think it's time for a break. Um, so why don't we take uh, about a 15 minute break, uh, so that would bring us up right to about five of, four of 11, um, and uh, then we'll come back and kick us back off with uh, Alan Corky. So let's take a break. Those of you watching at home, we'll be back in about 15 minutes.